Dickens was a most extraordinarily prolific correspondent. Uh, his in collected letters amount to 12 volumes, and there's still more being discovered, uh, 12 large volumes, of which this was the first, a sort of pioneering edition, the Pilgrim edition. And uh, um, I'd like to read to you, first of all, the letter that Dickens wrote to his friend Richard Johns, when um, Mary Hogarth died, obviously an event that was of enormous, um, monumental significance in his life and never stopped reverberating right through almost to the day that he died. Uh, this letter is written three weeks after the event, so he's had time to, as we say, process the experience. Um, it's written on mourning paper. And it starts like this. My dear Johns, I should have written earlier to you or Mrs. Johns, long ere this, had I not had so many painful and distressing demands on my time and exertions as to render me for a time apparently unmindful of many kind and esteemed friends. The loss we deplore, and to which the Pickwick notice bears reference, is the sudden death in this house of our dear sister, Mary Hogarth. On the day previous to that on which you dined with us, she had gone home to see her mamma. On the day after, she returned. On the Saturday evening, we went to the St. James's Theatre. She went upstairs to bed about one o'clock in perfect health and her usual delightful high spirits, was taken ill before she had undressed and died in my arms. Next afternoon, three o'clock, everything that could possibly be done was done, but nothing could save her. The medical men imagined it was a disease of the heart. From the day of our marriage, the dear girl has been the grace and life of our home, our constant companion, and the sharer of all our little pleasures. The love and affection which subsisted between her and her sister no one can imagine the extent of. We might have known that we were too happy together to be long without a change. The change has come and it has fallen heavily upon us. I have lost the dearest friend I ever had. Words cannot describe the pride I felt in her and the devoted attachment I bore her. She well deserved it with abilities far beyond her years, with every attraction of youth and beauty, and conscious as she must have been of everybody's admiration, she had not a single fault, and was in life almost as far above the foibles and vanity of her sex and age as she is now in heaven. Mrs. Dickens has had a trying task, for in the midst of her own affliction, she has had to soothe the sufferings of her bereaved mother, who was called here in time to see her child expire, and remained here in a state of total insensibility for a week afterwards. She has borne up through her severe trial, like what she is, a fine-hearted, noble-minded girl, I have removed her to a quiet cottage at Hampstead, where we think of staying for some weeks to come. And the first anguish of her grief being past, she is quite resigned and cheerful. From their earliest infancy to this moment, she can call up no single recollection of an unkind word or look having ever passed between them. And she looks forward to being mercifully permitted one day to rejoin her sister in that happy world for which God adapted her better than for this. I should have said that the affliction we have suffered brought on a miscarriage. 
but that she has perfectly recovered from it. Pray present my best remembrances to Mrs. Jones, and believe me that it will afford me the very greatest gratification if you will make this house your own when you next come to London. My dear Johns, very faithfully yours, Charles Dickens.